Welcome to a new episode of the Life Science Get Together podcast early in the morning with a cup of coffee and uh, a cup of tea. And I'm very happy today to talk with uh, one of my investment colleagues from the Nordics, Tiaro Weckrot. Tiaro, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Christian. It's great to be here. Tiaro, give us a little bit of background. Uh, what is your profession? What are you doing in the Nordics? Well, at the moment, um, I call myself in social media profiles as a entrepreneur and uh, investor. Uh, sometimes I call myself a co-entrepreneur, which means that I'm uh, definitely more than a just an investor. But uh, on the other hand, I'm not full-time entrepreneur in any of the companies I'm involved with. Uh, but I uh, tend to stick with my companies for a quite long period of time. Uh, come hell or high water, high water. so uh, I don't, uh, once I'm committed, I uh, tend to stick with the companies uh, for a multiple years. Uh, having said that, it's also important to cut your losses early, so uh, it's a fine balance. Uh, my background is, uh, I'm originally actually a pharmacist, a apotheker, like they say in, in, in uh, Central Europe, uh, but I have not done that uh, for a day in my life. Uh, it's just a uh, degree from the university I've uh, taken that gives me a certain uh, scientific background in uh, life sciences. Uh, at which industries are you most interested currently? What excites you? Well, that's been uh, the same since I uh, quit my day job 10 years ago. Uh, I'm uh, only focusing on the two um, industries that I can claim to know something about. Uh, they are life sciences and uh, fintech. Uh, having uh, worked in pharmaceutical industry for um, uh, five years and then uh, 11 years in investment banking. So that comes naturally. So I, I, I even even if I'm from Finland, I um, try to stay away from games, which is a big industry here, and uh, never work with mobile phone or that kind of uh, technologies or pulp and paper for that matter. So my, uh, my um, sector background is very untypical for a Finnish guy. Um, so, but on the, on the other hand, that gives me a lot of uh, freedom to uh, operate because there's not a lot of uh, competition. Uh, you mentioned that your background is untypical for, for a Finnish guy. Uh, how does the typical Finnish um, life science and early stage community look like these days in, uh, in, in your country? It is growing, but it is still very small because uh, we don't have much of a pharmaceutical industry um in, in this country traditionally it's uh, we have developed a few drugs but uh, it is not nowhere as big as it is in, uh, in denmark or in sweden uh, of, of the nordic region not to say the uh, uk or central europe but um there is a very uh, well growing um, medtech community medtech um, requires obviously less capital and a short time spans Mm -hmm. So um, the and we've had some success stories also in the public market uh, in medtech. So that is going well. More and more business angels coming in, and uh, quite a few VCs are making rounds in in Finland uh, in medtech. Uh, the pharmacy, uh, pharmaceuticals or drug development is still very. Uh, what I say, <laughs> it's not really on a professional or um, scaling level. There's the old pharma project coming um, now and then. There are a few public companies in the junior stock market, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, we don't have the same gifts like they do in uh, in uh, Norway and uh, sorry in um, Sweden and Denmark. Mm -hmm. How is uh, you mentioned that some companies are listed on the on the I guess Finnish stock market? Uh, how does it work in Finland? Um, are these uh, more mature companies that get listed, or are they also from the the early stages of development? Um, the early stage, but we only have one real um, mature pharma company, uh, mm -hmm. and even that is quite small in the pharma scale. It's like three or four billion market cap, I guess. Okay. okay. Um, but not all of them are listed in Helsinki. Some decide to list in Stockholm or in London. Uh, one of the more interesting ones uh, is actually listed in, in London. So uh, the capital market uh, being um, always a reflection of the local um industrial strength and uh, and heritage 
that means that it is uh, easier often for the emerging uh, life science companies from Finland to uh, raise capital from elsewhere. But having said that, like I said, in Meditech, it is getting uh, easier and uh, better also in Finland. Uh, Why do you think it's uh, easier for Medtech than for drug development companies? What's what's your view on the situation? Well, here we have two, uh, well, two reasons really. One is general. Um, it is not as complicated. Uh, people can understand what a um, device that measures your blood glucose or whatever that does. So general business angels can uh, do a Medtech. They can understand, feel comfortable with that. And that is a general uh, reason. Then the specific for this country, I guess, is that uh, we've had a, a couple of successful publicly listed medtech companies that have opened the doors and shown others that it can be done and uh, made quite a lot of people rich. So then that capital tends to um, be invested back into the same uh, sector. Uh, the one company I mentioned is called Revenio, which is a world leader in uh, glaucoma. Uh, screening and um, has in the last 10 years grown from uh, I guess like 20 million market cap to 2 billion so that has uh, been a very good example for others that it can be done. From 20 million to 2 billion uh, market capitalization. Um, Don't take me on the details that is approximate uh, scale yeah. it could be 1.5 or 2.5 now well And the company is listed in Helsinki, or is it? Yeah. Uh, did it, did, oh, that's great. That's great. That's a great success for, for the stock market. Yeah, sure. Although that's still a very much a small cap on in the international standards, particularly on the pharma. So, uh, like, well, when I worked in London in uh, mm -hmm. investment banking, small mid cap pharmaceuticals um, uh, were like, well, sharing uh, AG, the German one that used to still exist at that time, 15 billion market cap, that was mm -hmm. a small mid cap space. Uh, and now uh, we are talking about a success story that has reached 2 billion market cap 15 years later. So um, it's all relative. Now I'm pretty amazed with, uh, with the pandemic, a lot changed also on the stock market. When I think back um, to the time when I started in the life science industry, it was 2006. Um, this life science investments were more for uh, private equity funds, uh, experts in the field. And after the pandemic, when I look now on the market and talk with people, I think everybody knows names like BioNTech, Moderna. And um, 15 years ago, when I told my friends I'm moving into life science, they simply said, uh, are you nuts? Are you crazy? What are you doing? This industry doesn't understand. It's really difficult to understand for everybody. Uh, You have a vast experience in different roles of investment. You have a background in investment banking. Uh, you act as a business angel. And uh, what I remember from our past talks, you also had an eye or have an eye on crowdfunding. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the differences between the different investment roles. How do you view the life of business angels today? Um, when they are interested to invest in medtech and drug development? Uh, what are the secrets behind success for them? Business angels and drug development. I, um, unfortunately, I have to say I'm quite skeptical there. Mm -hmm. um, because um, you really need deep pockets. And uh, of course, while we could talk what is the definition of a business angel um, and what is the different model, where's the borderline between a business angel and a family office. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, to get the drug going really into phase one, that requires millions or tens of millions, which uh, not often even a group of uh, super angels is willing to put into one, one project. Uh, so um, I, I have to say I'm rather skeptical on uh, whether a business angel, unless he's really experienced and deep pocketed, should get involved in uh, drug development in the first place, period. That's, uh, haven't been there, made that mistake, uh, or guilty as everybody, I shouldn't make it again. Uh, and I knew that I was making a mistake. So uh, <laughs> people are not always behaving rationally, that's for sure. But I think it's true to start to be an early um, investor in a uh, emerging um, drug project. 
in medtech it is a very different matter of course because uh, unlike in drug development the uh, capital requirements are are uh, well, reasonable and then you don't need to wait for 15 years for the company to really make it i tried to mitigate the risks by focusing on uh, like university spin-offs uh, where you have already like five or ten year basic science uh, behind the project before it is uh, made into a company mm. and uh, quite a lot of public investment as well so then as a private investor you can uh, utilize the uh, public money that has uh, gone into the project um, and which obviously is non-dilutive but still even so with all these uh, caveats it is a uh, it's a difficult to really make rational uh, successful investment yeah drug development is um is a very special animal i think you mentioned it takes until to come to a significant value inflection point probably 20 to 30 million per project uh, you know, just think about the preclinical studies manufacturing and um when business angels can't mitigate the risk over several projects it's really challenging to be part of that mm -hmm. uh except those who have experience in the field and when i look at uh, the development of uh, business angels that became successful in life science and later on went to raise funds most of them were scientists, uh, started with a company, uh, made money on two ends. On one hand, they founded the company and uh, got shares of the company. On the other hand, they got also a salary. So it's basically mm -hmm. after Series A, B and C, they could move forward. Um, Medtech also agreed uh, the sums, I think, are much smaller uh, to come to a significant uh, um value inflection point um, to also have a chance to sell the company or get it listed on the stock market. Sorry, having said all that, uh, last week, or oh, sorry, two weeks ago, I was mm -hmm. in Berlin and I had a lunch with a um, VC fund manager that I know based in Berlin. And uh, we discussed the recent uh, developments, of course, and it was fantastic to be traveling again. I had a since COVID started, I had only, that was only a third time I was abroad. I agree to that. That was, that was interesting. But uh, then uh, regarding COVID, he told me about this uh, BioNTech, the, uh, mm -hmm. the German company, yeah. um, which of course everybody knows by now because of the vaccine. Um, but I didn't know before he told me the background that there's this uh, German farm company, I think it's textile family, um, company who uh, has invested in that early um, and made um, very nice investment out of it. So that obviously can work. And uh, we have a very recent success story where, where a private early investor has done well of a drug development company and very high risk one uh, for that mm -hmm. matter. But th that is obviously out of, uh, well, I would be out of my league there and most people who call themselves business angels, because in that case, the family had tens uh, of years of uh, experience in the pharma industry and uh, hundreds of millions to invest so yes if you are empty pockets if you are in that fortunate position uh, and you know what you're doing yeah go for it but uh, any um, regular business angel i wouldn't recommend i mean the thing is with many i'm no i'm no expert in biotech um i know the company the company did a great job in developing a vaccine what impressed me was um the quick time to patients within 12 months they went through basically the, the early and enabling studies up to phase three and uh, got an emergency use um, uh, um, application from, from the regulatories in, in Europe and the United States. Um, but the thing is, um, when they started, I think it was in 2008, the risk of a novel platform technology to fail is almost 100%. So yeah. Many companies that start with a prom promising technology really fail, not because of management failures or lack of money. It's just simply when the science doesn't work in patients, you can't move forward. Yeah. And uh, so everybody investing in early stages must understand that it can be a jackpot. But uh, I would say 99 out of 100 cases uh, won't make it even close to getting, getting listed. Do you oh, see that similar or differently? I very much agree with you. And then uh, I will just make the obvious conclusion that expected return is most likely negative. So uh, <laughs> if you multiply the, um, well, these, or quantify the success multiplied by the probability of that success, and then uh, uh, the uh, loss you make in case of failure multiplied by the 
probability of that failure, I guess you end up with a negative number. But then somebody told me that um, in his view, the world history and mankind uh, proceed and go forward by driven by people who do stupid things. So I guess this might, might be another um, uh, example where seemingly irrational behavior turns out to be good for the uh, mankind as a whole. So uh, nothing but uh, as, as inspirational and uh, admiration for these kind of people who, uh, who do that. Yeah, I think the companies must click into the value chain when you look at, uh, there is this ARC fund in the United States, uh, it's run by Kathy Wood. Um, I became a huge fan, so um, I'm a member of a fan club, <laughs> um, actually. And she put together a fund, that's uh, an ETF that's called the Genomics Revolution, where she invests um, money specifically in companies of which she thinks uh, in gene editing can make a difference in future. It's uh, a mixed um, portfolio of uh, diagnostics and drug development companies and also very early basic research companies. Um, what's interesting is that the landscape changed when I entered in 2006 in the industry in Europe. It was mostly uh, working with SPVs, for companies that are focusing on a single asset, on one drug only, moving them forward and trying to sell it to the pharma industry. And when I look now at her portfolio companies, um, they mostly have uh, a large pipeline in the background. So they mitigate basically the risk internally with uh, running uh, 10 to 20 uh, projects at the same time. And sometimes have a decent uh, valuation on the stock market going into the tens uh, of billions. Um, do you see from your investment back, uh, banking backgrounds, do you see a chance that the life science industry now fueled with SARS-CoV-2 uh, gets another push that more and more companies uh, go public and also open up uh, investments for private investors that uh, can stay away from business angels but come into a later stage of development and still make decent returns? Well, that is quite a lot a question of both fundamentals and sentiment. Mm. But I guess my answer would be yes. Um, when we have, uh, again, a new wave of uh, successful companies like BioNTech and Moderna that show that you really can, can do it, I think that will inevitably uh, support um, the interest of uh, private investors, uh, public in, uh, in the um, pharma and meditech sectors in the public market, but also there will be more money coming in from the LPs into the VC funds. Uh, which in return, of course, uh, will feed the uh, development of uh, companies in these fields. So that is, um, I do think that is likely. But then again, um, which will be the sector or the field within pharmaceuticals uh, where the next success stories will come? Um, I don't know. I, I don't believe that will be vaccines. Um, we need to remember that this mRNA technology was not really uh, mainly being developed for vaccines or infections before COVID-2, uh, that was for, uh, for oncology, which really, mm -hmm. of course remains a big field. So that was a very opportunistic, but great and a fantastic move to start uh, using the technology for uh, as an ad hoc, very fast basis for, uh, uh, for a vaccination. But then will that, um, will the focus again return to oncology? Will there be something else that will get most of the capital? Um, don't know. My personal bet uh, is, and I'm partly talking my own book here because I have a <laughs> investment in a company uh, in this field, would be neurology. Mm -hmm. And um, um, well, when I was ending my career in investment banking as a um, um, analyst covering the pharma companies, then um, a lot of big pharma were withdrawing from CNS field. Mm -hmm. uh, companies like Pfizer and uh, Glaxo's were withdrawing from uh, depression, which had been a very, very big market in uh, well after the launch of Prozac, basically. Um, and then um, since then, we had multiple failures, uh, drug after drug in Alzheimer's and other neurodegenerative diseases. Um, so there's every month there was another one, another one bite the dust kind of news that okay now there was failure in phase two quite often even in phase three after promising phase two uh, results. 
So um, that has been a very, very sad story. Now, after Biogen um, got the first drug through the FDA for Alzheimer's, hmm, well, there may be a lot of follow-on drugs. Uh, in that field, because it can be done. And the pricing, of course, uh, is controversial. And no matter what you think about the FDA decision, uh, that is a genuine break, uh, game changer, I would call it, uh, in Alzheimer's, obviously, but then possibly in the CNS field uh, in more generally. So, uh, and of course, with the double aging of population, uh, we all should hope for that, for new developments and new breakthroughs in, uh, in the CNS field. Yeah, there was a huge controversial discussion about the Biogen approval. Um, but what's your opinion about uh, the FDA move that, uh, as far as I remember, they pulled out an old drug, uh, presented new data and uh, got it approved, even though the efficacy is not uh, that promising. But what's your opinion on the Biogen approval? Why, uh, why did the FDA do that? I don't want to express an opinion on the decision and charge whether that is like right or wrong from the FDA. Um, I, um, perhaps it is enough to say that I was surprised by the uh, pricing afterwards. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the FDA does not have a, any role in the bi bi pricing decision, but uh, uh, Biogen obviously um, took the view that they don't really care about the public opinion. It's a five-digit number per treatment. I think it's... it's uh, do, you, do you know the exact pricing? I think it was... I have much. seen it, but it was like uh, closer to 100,000 per year. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> on that level. And I was expecting you know, something like five, ten... Um, so, and I'm not familiar with the techni technology, how it is manufactured. Mm. So perhaps it is difficult to manufacture. So they could not choose the strategy of, uh, of uh, making it a mass drug with uh, 5,000 a year pricing. And so it has to be more profitable on a uh, limited number of patients and high price tag. Uh, I don't know, it, it could be either or. Um, but uh, my, coming back to my own personal interest here, I have been a, uh, I was actually the first outside investor and have been a uh, investor in all the consequent uh, rounds in a Finnish company called uh, Combinostics, mm -hmm. which is, well, had the Swedish uh, CEO and now actually just hired a German CEO, um, but still based in, in Finland. And it is doing early stage screening of Alzheimer's. So this is the reason why I'm obviously a full disclosure, I'm kind of talking my own uh, book here, <laughs> uh, because uh, uh, for a company that has been using the AI and uh, and uh, machine learning tools for early detection of the uh, of the uh, disease, the best thing that can happen is that there is uh, the first disease modifying drug coming to the market because then suddenly the biggest challenge disappears, which has been that there's no real incentive to uh, do an early detection or diagnosis of the disease because there's no real uh, effective intervention. Now there is, and um, I'm sure there will be more when uh, other pharma companies uh, return to the CNS field. Um, your explanation clicks very well into another explanation I heard in uh, the so-called All In podcast. It's a podcast that's run out of San Francisco by four American investors. And um, one of them is uh, Jamat. Palantir, I hope I speak his name right. And his theory was that uh, the FDA wanted to create a market uh, for similar to reasons that you mentioned. He also said there was nothing going on for years uh, in Alzheimer or other CNA diseases because it's complicated. Uh, a lot of money was burned, uh, big pharma failed, investors failed. And uh, basically the sentiment on the market was, let's get out of it. Uh, it's, it's untreatable, it's uncurable. And he mentioned that with the move of the FDA and also accepting the high pricing, what they're basically doing is creating a market uh, with a low entry barrier to say, look guys, there is not much going on in the field. Uh, we accept drugs. We have now one approved. It's not the best one. Just challenge it and make a better one. And uh, 
you can uh, then become the second or third drug with better efficacy data or better safety data for patients. And also what you mentioned uh, for the diagnostics. I mean, now there is a field for diagnostics and that motivates scientists to move further into that field. I very much like the, this explanation of uh, how money can really help uh, to cure people. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree there. But then uh, I, I, one thing that, um, one issue that will come back to the surface now is this, in health policy terms, is that, um, um, well, the pricing, who should have the control of the pricing? And uh, in the last 20, 30 years, uh, the regulator who approves the drugs um, has not had any influence on the pricing. Like in Europe, EMA approves the drugs, and then it is um, up to the market or the most member states in the EU, it is the uh, government who then decides whether they give reimbursed or not. Uh, and I think that is still a um, sound policy, and uh, I mm -hmm. personally support it. But I do think it will come under attack now uh, after Biogen's approval. Um, I'm sure if, they, if FDA had had any say on pricing, they probably wouldn't uh, have recommended such a price uh, for Biogen. Um, and of course, now they can partly be blamed for it because they, uh, quite rationally, they put a uh, phase four um, requirement on the drug that you really need to show that it works. And then the company come back to say that, yeah, that's very expensive. That's why we need to price it high. And, uh, and so on. So uh, it, it is a complex issue, and I don't think there's one um, right or wrong answer. But I do think this discussion will come back to the surface again. I think this is a very important discussion that we need to have on a social level. Uh, what's the right pricing for drugs? I mean, on one hand, it's the availability also for everybody in the world. So that uh, first class medicine is not only available to the rich, but also to the poor. When I just look at SARS-CoV-2, I mean, um, basically everybody in the Western world has access to vaccines and uh, the WHO is complaining um, that uh, poor countries, that healthcare workers and risk groups simply don't get vaccines. On the other hand, knowing um, what drug development does cost actually, I mean, a new therapy is at the minimum $1 billion mm -hmm. up to free. When I look at Alzheimer, I would assume without knowing the number, it's just gut feeling, I would assume we go up to five, six, seven billion invested uh, to bring one drug on the market. And somehow the value chain must be fueled back uh, with revenues from the market so that we can uh, also develop the next generation um, uh, of drugs. How do you see this pricing discussion, especially um, uh, the, the problematic between uh, rich countries and poor countries? Do you, do you have any, any solution in mind? No, not really. Uh, I, I wish I had, but uh, and if, if it was an easy one, I'm sure it would have been solved. Uh, the only addition I would make perhaps is that it's one thing to look at the, well, the population at one spot uh, point of time. Mm -hmm. Then, also, of course, you can also take, take, make the argument that you can look at human beings who live during the flow of time. So now when uh, we start from somewhere and there is a drug that is being used, uh, yes, mainly for the rich now, but then when the patent expires 20 years from now, it is very cheap to use globally. So um, the uh, even limited availability right now helps, uh, even among the rich people, will help people or poor people 20 years from now, mm -hmm. because then we get somewhere. And then uh, do we have a response? This, I, sorry, this gets very philosophical. Uh, do we have a responsibility for all the people who live now or also for people who are, uh, will be alive 20 years from now? I don't have an answer, but uh, this will get very blurry, of course, <laughs> from an ethical yeah. point of view. Yeah, I think for generations, uh, it was survival of the human race. Um, when I look now on the planet, I think the survival of the human race is not a problem anymore. So it's now uh, making our life better. Um, discussion of fairness. And I think these are these complicated matters that uh, need a lot of debate and discussion. And uh, I don't also think that there is an easy solution to that. I agree. Um, uh, there will need to be a lot of discussion and debate. But uh, I think we are fooling ourselves if we think that in the end of the discussion, there will be a clear answer that everybody will agree on that does not happen 
Yeah. I mean, also when I look at the capitalist system, I think it's open to everybody uh, to make money. Um, when I look on the stock market, everybody can invest and yet so so few people are, are really doing it. Let's go back to the availability of capital. I think this is one problem that I do see currently in Europe. Uh, I mean, it got a little bit better with the SARS-CoV-2 vaccines. How do you see the availability of capital for early stage companies in medtech and drug development in Europe? Do we have enough money in that field or could it be improved? Well, in this country, we don't, but uh, that's a special case. I think um, it's very easy to say that there's lack of capital when actually quite often there is a lack of good projects. Uh, because I, exactly there's lack of capital that kind of does, that's an argument that does not really have a, uh, um, a um, like opponent. There just is no capital. Uh, if you say that the project was bad and that's why it was not um, supported, then you kind of blame the project and no one wants to do that uh, unnecessarily. The people who walk away and do not invest, they don't want to say because then they will need to end up uh, spending time with, your, with uh, arguing with the profit they are walking away from and not looking at the next one. So this becomes easily a uh, truism, whether it is true or not. Um, but on a general level, I, I do think uh, pharma industry, like drug development, is a more tricky to support with commercial money than uh, than average uh, because of the reasons that we we gone through already. And I think, um, and this might be a odd comment to come from a capitalist, uh, but I, I do think a, a public money and uh, state uh, support is warranted in early stage drug development because otherwise, uh, I guess a lot of good projects will not get off the ground. Um, I have been doing in the past uh, this uh, Horizon 2020 um, uh, like expert work for the European Commission and I just saw that the new new project is uh, kicking off uh, this summer so and I had a brief look and the at the uh, criteria and I think that is a very good project on a European level every small country like Austria or Finland is too small to have a reasonable or sensible public support program for a, a drug research. Uh, I think that kind of projects are very uh, justified in uh, drug development. And uh, some money should be, uh, I'm very happy as a taxpayer to see some of the money being uh, uh, directed towards early stage, very risk, um, but moonshot projects. I think that is a good idea, but still, don't believe when somebody says there's lack of capital quite a lot quite often it is not the case that the lack of good projects and sensible teams because um i guess every business angel has seen a very good project solid science but then a team where the founder is not really a person you want to um, support or commit to support for many years to come Let's let's stay a little bit on uh, on this point. The importance of a team. Um, can you uh, explain it a little bit more? What it means that you also need the right team to develop the technology. Uh, what are you looking at when you um, interview a team for investment? Well, I'm afraid I don't have anything new to say there. Uh, anything I say will sound like a cliche. <laughs> you you need a <laughs> you need both the jobs and the Bosniak. I guess that's all I can say. So um, often you have a good technology, particularly in this country, we have great engineers, good science, but then we don't have the uh, Steve Jobs guy. We don't have uh, um, the commercial angle, marketing, sales, they are underdeveloped, and you need to ask that as well. Um, but everybody knows that. It's, it's nothing new. That's a good question. I mean, if everybody knew it, why uh, why is not everybody uh, looking at that? I mean, it's the, basically it's the same with listed companies. So some, especially when I talk with um, continental European companies, it doesn't matter whether it's, if it's early stage or later stages, they very often just promote the technology. With a great technology, it works. When I look at uh, companies listed in the United States, um, 
many CEOs are the Steve Jobs guys, Steve Jobs personalities who have a big vision, a grand vision, and who also have the drive to move the company forward. Mm -hmm. I really wonder when I when I work with uh, incubation programs and acceleration programs that there is not more emphasis on that part. I think it's really the key part of success to a company. Uh, one investor in one in uh, podcast interview said, uh, an A team with a B technology will always... Um, be better than a B team with an A technology. So it's really looking at, at this team angle. And it's good to hear from you that you see it similar. I think this is one of the, the, the most important things that we should emphasize when founding companies. Mm -hmm. uh, you're right, but then you, you need both really. I mean, because uh, just the, uh, let me talk uh, on a general term, like European, American way of doing things. I'm, none of them is really correct in their own right. Um, let me ask you, do you think Peronas would have happened in Europe. Because in a way, you can argue that while uh, many countries, many people in Europe develop the technology to mass and forget the commercial angle, then you have, you can make the similar argument that in, in the US quite often you can just live with a story without having a substance. And Theranos obviously being a ultimate example of that. So um, you do need a solid, scientific basis and uh, good engineering combined with the uh, commercial and, and uh, selling the story really to, yep. uh, uh, to uh, not only your customers but to, to the financiers as well but then again i'm, I'm thinking aloud here well very close to you uh, there was uh, we we had in fintech side <clears throat> we had a very bad case of uh, uh, unrealized uh, expectations wire fraud uh, <laughs> <laughs> which uh, Why, okay. I also had a few chats about in, in Germany when I was in Berlin, and uh, that, um, well, in a way, you can argue that it was a European Theranos, but on a different field, obviously. Yeah, Wirecard is a story on its own. It's uh, one of the Black Swan events of the last year that are uh, just unbelievable. Um, it looked like a good company, good team, good space, good area. And when I also look now on uh, the companies operating in the field, PayPal, Square, also the old traditional credit card companies like Visa, MasterCard, they're all doing well. They just need to move forward and be part of the game and Wirecard. Mm. With a very interesting story, uh, let's say it just was a huge case of fraud. And uh, no matter how good the due diligence is, I think this, is, this cannot be avoid, avoided entirely such a risk. And unfortunately, what I, see, I mean with Wirecard, a lot of retail investors lost a lot of money because they were just uh, throwing all the capital on one company in that field. And this is the real tragedy behind it, uh, because all these regulations, uh, I think they're coming from the 18th, 19th century with the picture of the, the rich white capitalist man who has enough money, who can invest in a company. But when I look at the reality of retail investment these days, um, they simply invest uh, their possessions uh, very tall in one company and then have to face the same regulations like uh, multi-billion dollar funds. Um, so I think this will be a regulatory question, and also a philosophical question, how to treat uh, this situation so that such cases like Wirecard won't happen anymore. That, is, uh, that takes, to, takes us to the, not sure if you want to go there yet, but that goes us to the other field of mine, which is, uh, let's say, public investments and uh, crowdfunding mm -hmm. and all that. And I'm uh, very familiar with the regulation on, uh, on that, both on the European level and the uh, Nordics. Um, and um, uh, it, it is quite weird how different the regulation and customer protection is. Uh, if you look at the, what is called crowdfunding, uh, i.e. investment, uh, investments from retail investors, a big number of them into risky projects. Mm -hmm. um, there has been a lot of focus on the investor protection. And like many companies, many member states in, the, in the Europe have required that you cannot invest more than 1,000 euros in a, in a uh, uh, project or more than, uh, not more than 10% of your net worth, like the, that was the UK approach. And uh, a lot of warnings uh, and so on. That um, is justified, I think. That is very uh, well um, justified uh, in uh, investor protection point of view. But then on the other hand, in the public market, we don't have that. Uh, in wealth management, yes, but uh, like you say, a, um, 
guy from Vienna or Munich could put all his pension money into Wirecard. And uh, there's no such safeguards in uh, if you just do it by an online broker. Um, and I, I don't know whether they should or not, but I do think it is weird that we're treating um, uh, like different, uh, or like legally different, but in practice very similar um, projects and investment cases very so differently from regulatory point of view. Um, so uh, I think my, and this is a controversial thought that I have been saying for years, that crowdfunding actually is really nothing new. People have been done doing that since uh, the Phoenicians uh, in, uh, in the antique times yep. when they invest in a ship uh, or cargo uh, jointly. So that, that's nothing new. It's just now done by the internet. But the controversial thought is that actually IPOs and public investment, they are crowdfunding. Mm -hmm. They are crowdfunding. You, you just collect money from retail investors, throw in a few VCs or institutional investors into the mix, and then you have a wide shareholder base. Then whether you do it on a paper or papyrus for that matter, or over the internet, that is just the question of the technology that, of, of the day that you use. Yeah, that's true. I mean, crowdfunding is an old instrument. It's just, I think, reinvented and reutilized with, um, with the internet technology. Um, how, how to protect it? I mean, I always thought, um, I mean, on one hand, I think there is a, the, there is a lack of uh, investment expertise uh, available in our society. I think this is, uh, education is one problem. Uh, it cannot all be just with... Uh, let's say it's called with regulatory changes. But on the other hand, when a company is listed in a premium European uh, index like the DAX and also audited by one of the world's best auditing firm, um, and then I see that there is almost no penalty <laughs> at the end when $2 billion are just missing, um, and everything is blamed on the retail investors. I think that systemically there is something uh, not really just and right, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Obviously, uh, you're right that um, retail investor who puts money in a DAX 30 company should be able to trust the auditors. So I think AY definitely has a lot to answer in that case which obviously is not the case in early stage uh, crowdfunding. Um, and, uh, but then also it just happened. So um, you can argue that all these regulations and um, that we have in place don't seem to work, uh, not in the public market because of wire card. And then these uh, protections that we have in so-called crowdfunding space, mm -hmm. like unlisted, there have been huge frauds there as well. Um, so very, from very different angles um, or regulatory approaches, we always seem to be getting the failures through. Uh, so perhaps we would need to have a full like re-engineering from bottom up uh, of all financial regulations. And it should be, I think, uh, like um, uh, very uh, agnostic uh, towards the status outside of the company and uh, should be more transparent so that people would learn them and be able to follow them. Because now we have this patchwork of regulation and not even a lawyer or specialist in the field that can remember by heart all the regulations, which then enables uh, bad guys like this. So who was the name of the Austrian guy who was the head of uh, God, Marcus Braun? Marcus Braun, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. then that, that uh, patchwork lets that kind of crooks through. Nothing good comes out when Austrians go to Munich to conquer the world. <laughs> in any case, that's so. what the Germans told me in Berlin <laughs> two weeks ago. That uh, was in context of Wirecard. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, enforced diversification. When when I think, I mean, uh, the way out of uh, to manage risk is to diversify in a portfolio. And what you said in crowdfunding, uh, that seems to work well. Um, it's the own responsibility of any investor. So, I mean, when I look at Warren Buffett, for example, a pro in the field with, I think, 44% or 46% of his Berkshire Hathaway fund uh, or conglomerate uh, invest or is invested in Apple. It's one company. Um, so very risky. But for the average retail investors, they always think... Uh, 
when you think you understand and know the company, always assume you don't. <laughs> oh, it's just uh, as long as you can't invest 500,000 euros in a proper due diligence team, send it uh, to a company and review it properly, always assume you don't know anything about the company. Mm, sure. And I've learned that now. Also, um, we discussed earlier that I've uh, moved more into the public space. Mm. And uh, it's always so that uh, no matter whether the company is public or a private um, startup, you really learn to know, know the company and the team after you have invested. Uh, so yes, you can do all the DD you like, but then you really learn to know the strengths and the weaknesses and the risks and the opportunities only after you have put in the money. Uh, then the learning really starts. It's a good angle that you're taking. So you moved from uh, the business angel crowdfunding space now more to the uh, publicly traded space. What are the three main differences between these uh, three investment styles that you see? Uh, the obvious one as a board member, uh, if you are one, are the um, responsibilities. In publicly traded uh, company, of course, you need to have the confidentiality, inside information. Uh, they need to be really uh, professionally handled. And uh, well, even if Wirecard might make you think otherwise, there are really sanctions uh, if, if you don't follow the rules. While uh, a lot of the regulation and uh, laws, uh, like MAR, the market abuse uh, regulation, they don't really apply for the uh, unlisted space uh, because the uh, the shares are not uh, public traded instruments. But even so, it is in a similar. It's very similar in a sense that it's better to just uh, behave like any company was a public company, even if it's not, because um, MAR regulation in a way that just good habits, uh, like good manners, uh, to uh, treat your well, other people and uh, co-investors uh, with uh, respect. Um, but then, uh, so that's one big difference. And then uh, I think psychologically, very important is that, uh, at least I'm not aware of uh, a way how to short a unlisted stock. Because in a private company, uh, all the information you give out, that is always intended for the next VC, um, well, B round, C round, and so on, so that somebody comes in and puts more money into the company. Uh, in, a, in a public space, any information that goes out can be used by, uh, for similar um, purposes, but then again, you, there always can be a hedge fund who wants to short your stock. Uh, and that's a good thing, because that keeps a certain level of discipline uh, in, in the market. Uh, even Wirecard was attacked by the short sellers, and um, they, they were right, of course, <laughs> in the end. Uh, that kind of mechanism is missing from the private market. Um, and I, I don't see how it could be done, but it, I think it would be good uh, to have that uh, like uh, whip available for somebody uh, to keep the uh, management and the board in, um, in line. Yeah, this is an interesting perspective, short selling on, on, on private companies. I mean, um, when you look on the market, I think Wirecard was an exceptional case, but luckily it's not the norm. It's just uh, an exception. And what you say is uh, transparency. I think it's a very important point. Um, that also makes sense for private companies always be as transparent as possible with your investors and honest and upfront. If there are problems, tell them. Everybody can deal with problems and uh, don't hide them away. So I think the, the companies start going southwards when there is a lack of transparency. And this is uh, tapping more into the personality of, uh, of the board members. Um, when you look at listed companies, I expect that they have a certain level of transparency already established. And also when hiring their executives, uh, that they look for uh, proven track records and um, trained people in the field to know how to handle that. Um, the short selling, I have no idea how that can work with with, with private companies, mm. the public market. I mean, there was this, uh, what, what I find interesting currently on the public market is the reverse short selling that comes out of uh, Reddit, where retail investors gather up and to pretty much the same like short sellers, but just the other way around, uh, they look for stock that um, 
have a high percentage of um, um, of the shares sold, uh, sold short, like GameStop, for example, and then start betting on that, that they can push the short sellers out when they throw enough money on the company. How do you yeah. see that development? Um, well, it's a free world. I mean, that's a uh, dangerous game, but I think that's just a very healthy mechanism to be there, uh, for sure. Um, but, uh, well, that's called short squeeze, uh, of course. But uh, I'm afraid uh, retail investors will eventually lose a lot of money doing that as well. Uh, because uh, like a, un well, a short case that is unjustified by the fundamentals can turn against you. So a Reddit driven short squeeze that is not based on fundamentals, of course, can blow on your face. Um, and uh, I have not been following so closely, but uh, I would assume that some of cases like that would have already happened. Um, I was following it. I, I got aware of that in January. And I think GameStop is interesting because the major shareholder uh, is also an American billionaire who um, also made his money with Apple. He invested 90% of his uh, capital into one company, similar like Warren Buffett, and then the other one in GameStop. Um, the interesting thing was I saw it similar in January, uh, like you did, that it's very risky for retail investors and looked a little bit at the community and the feedback I got from this Reddit community was quite interesting. I think it's, it's an interpretation I see uh, mostly millennials in that field, so young people. Uh, and interestingly, when I pointed out in, in chat discussions with them uh, that it's risky, that they can lose money, um, most of them to respond it are fully aware of the risk. And there was just uh, this baseline response where they said, uh, it's gambling. We know that. We gamble. So mm -hmm. I think as long as people are aware of what they are doing and uh, they know it's uh, this investment style is gambling, uh, it's funny, but what I think is, is good on a social level is that uh, with this new trend, let's call it um, social media trading, uh, or like Robin Hood, who also makes uh, uh, investment accessible to people with small pockets, uh, I think there is a huge percentage of young people getting engaged at a very early age with the stock market and start training the right habits. In the end of the day, I think creating wealth and uh, positive returns on the stock market is just a matter of training. And to present it in a fun and entertaining way is, in my eyes, a good thing. Yeah, I very much agree. I'm um, not sure how that would be said in English. Are the people's capitalist, is that a mm -hmm. thing? Uh, false capitalism in, in German. Uh, we have a very similar word in Finnish. I'm that to the core. I, I really believe in it uh, strongly that um, the, um, the, the uh, benefits of the success of new innovations and companies should be widely distributed uh, to the uh, society and uh, to the population. And uh, of course, one could argue that it is good to do that via taxation and then uh, the social benefits and the social transfers. Uh, and they, of course, have their their um, place in, in the whole. But uh, when there's a widely spread uh, share ownership of companies, that uh, involves also the market mechanism and uh, a genuine feeling of where the um, where money comes from, basically, and innovations and uh, what drives the world uh, forward. And uh, I don't know about you, but I don't really get that feeling when I pay tax or look at the, uh, <laughs> the corporate, about well, the public governance. Uh, so then um, I think that's good and it drives a society in a whole, a whole into the right direction. So fully agreed. And I'm actually one of the companies I'm involved with is a uh, it's uh, mainly in Finland now, but it's um, started as a equity research boutique, but it's now mm -hmm. more like a community management uh, for small shareholders, between small shareholders and um, uh, public companies. And I, I, I see a lot of uh, further developments on that Rx. There will be a lot of uh, new companies, business models coming up. Um, and I think uh, even some European uh, companies are growing quite nicely. Um, 
on top of this uh, US driven uh, social investment Reddit type of uh, investment, which hopefully will, will become more informed and uh, educated going forward. I mean, it's a philosophical question that you raised. So it's the, uh, is taxation better than investments? Is distribution of wealth by politicians the solution to everything? I was a happy taxpayer before 2020. So I also believe um, to have certain social standards established on a European scale is a good thing for society. Uh, no poverty, accessible healthcare system. Um, after 2020, I'm not so sure anymore. I think um, the um, the best way to handle complexity in our society um, is to have a lot of small companies and a lot of people trying out different things and uh, nature will take care that uh, the fittest will survive. And uh, those ideas that don't work, got, uh, they don't move forward anyways. So I think there is a lot of... Uh, solution potential in this uh, crowd-based funding that goes over the stock market to just bet on the, the right thing. So I don't think that politicians, um, do they have the right, the right systems in place to solve complex problems that we face these days, like climate yeah. change, for example? Hmm? That's an interesting thought. So what specifically drove that change of mind, change of heart of yours? What do you, what do you, I didn't, uh, well, there was a, Why did you change your mind? Obviously, it must have been something to do with COVID. Um, when I look at uh, the decisions that were made in the past 18 months in uh, handling the disease and analyzing the disease, um, I think a lot of regulations have been put in place that simply don't have a benefit. Mm. Um, or a limited benefit. So when I compare, for example, um, wearing masks um, is mandatory in many states. Austria went um, down the route that um, FFP2 masks are mandatory uh, of wearing. But when I look at the evidence and when I read through studies, I, I don't see much justification for that. So, mm -hmm. but now we are sticking with this regulation for six months. Um, it's a similar thing when I look at uh, distribution of vaccines, for example, the WHO says, uh, please don't vaccinate uh, people below 18 because we have, a, we have a lack of vaccines worldwide. Um, and there is a lot of pressure in Austria to vaccinate children. So I see a little bit of uh, disconnect between uh, what works and what the evidence shows and political decisions. So... I think politics are good. I mean, it's also in other European countries. Politics went down the route of micromanaging everything. So I also see it in Germany, see it in France, see it in the United Kingdom. And um, I, I mean, did we get rid of the coronavirus in the last 12 months? I don't think so. But uh, we put regulations in place uh, that tried to achieve that goal. Even though it was clear, it, it, it doesn't go down uh, down this route. So the claim that uh, comes up now with all this COVID is, okay, how can we pay back the debt that we have taken out, uh, tax the rich? Um, it's just a redistribution of uh, capital from companies and private people to political decision makers. So I asked myself the question, is that really helping to uh, simplify the complex problems we have right now to just uh, take money from the private side and redistribute it to politicians and uh, give them the power of choice how we solve problems? Or is it better to let the money work and be deployed into companies and redeployed into companies with investments, either via revenues or via direct investments, uh, and make those entrepreneurs work on solving the problems. And when I look on uh, what really happens right now in the world, where the big solutions came from in the past 20 years, uh, for example, BioNTech, it was financed by a family office. And it was moved forward by uh, a couple, basically. They mm -hmm. put together the basic science, they had the drive, they had the expertise, and uh, they were also supported by Bill Gates. Uh, these are all not politicians. So, and they brought forth a solution. When I... It's an interesting thought. It's, uh, but um, I, th I think it's too early to tell which direction 
the uh, overall sentiment will fall because uh, uh, you are making a, making good arguments there. Then on the other hand, we haven't seen the states really impose their authority on people for well, about 50, 60 years in this manner, like border, closing the borders uh, and uh, making mm. this kind of compulsory new state imposed uh, social norms. Um, so you could also argue that now actually states are back. Uh, it will be more, uh, more uh, like uh, authoritative era we are entering. Mm. And um, I think it's too early to, to tell. I mean, it could turn uh, turn either way. But um, what I would personally hope is that we would have more coordination at least on European level because this uh, uh, patchwork of uh, travel restrictions, which seem to change not only within uh, between countries, but also within countries, uh, not even the authorities seem to know what is uh, now allowed and what is not. Uh, we should have um, more um, uh, more uh, coordination, at least within uh, Europe, so that we know what is forbidden and uh, what is not. Uh, that's uh, for sure. But then uh, going to the next stage on what that will mean on uh, on uh, uh, well, macroeconomy investments um, and also say fintech and life sciences, my sectors. I think the big question is: Will people trust the money? Uh, and uh, the uh, the structures we have in place, um, and that leads to question whether we will have hyperinflation or not. And uh, then there are consequent questions whether the cryptos and gold will be a good thing to own or a bad thing to own. Uh, and then pricing power: if we have a very high inflation, um, then probably one of the good sectors to be in would be life sciences, drugs because then there would be price and power to really follow uh, the, uh, the depreciation of value of money, i.e. inflation. Um, I think these are very interesting trends to follow in the next uh, one to three years. And uh, uh, I don't have an answer, but I think uh, any investor in, uh, well, in general, in any sector, but uh, also in uh, life sciences and uh, fintech should uh, start to think about the risk um, the black swan risk of uh, hyperinflation again, because uh, our generation has not really experienced that. Um, last time we had meaningful inflation was well in the early 90s, late 80s, and uh, since then we have not we have forget forgotten what it really is like. Yeah, I think it was in the 90s the last time in um, Eastern Europe after the um the change in the political system in eastern europe i think romania was one of the countries that uh, had vast hyperinflation for a period mm -hmm. of time which was uh, really challenging for multinational companies to deal with that um, but since then it's pretty much stable mm -hmm. i mean you also see the shift in europe to a more authoritarian uh, leadership style in politics I'm just not confident that this is uh, the right move uh, to approach future problems, because most of the problems that we are talking right now, I mean, cryptocurrencies, for example, as you brought it up, uh, these are complex problems. How can we how can we prove our systems? How can we make them more trustworthy? Uh, what does what is the right system to move the money forward? Uh, is it cryptocurrencies? Is it the old systems uh, consisting of banks and a lot of decision makers in between? Uh, also, when you look at the health problems. Um, life science, it's its a scientific community and uh, nobody knows everything. So the traditional way to solve scientific problems was by debate. And when you look at an authoritarian leadership style, uh, a, an open debate uh, is not really part of an authoritarian leadership style, in my opinion. Uh, also, when you look at climate change or uh, uh, this uh, electric cars or uh, hydropowered cars, uh, it's all complex issues that we are dealing with. And um, my personal opinion is that the libertarian lifestyle and uh, decision-making style most likely uh, resembles better nature and uh, helps that the, the right decisions uh, become the strongest uh, via debate and uh, put the right choices forward. But it's, I think it's, it's really philosophical at this point. Mm -hmm. 
But I think uh, COVID has certainly also led to some breakthroughs, like, of course, uh, mRNA technology, but also Mm -hmm. the tool we are using right now. Uh, Who had heard about uh, Zoom and uh, Teams calls one and a half years ago? And of course, uh, the technology was there, Mm -hmm. but it was not widely adapted. So um, in a way, we did not miss this uh, good crisis. It led to uh, something very... Uh, very uh, progressive and uh, good uh, use of technology going, going forward. And um, but then uh, in the next phase, when we move into post-COVID world and uh, see what happens in place and uh, so on, I'm sure they also will continue to innovation. But that's also the key question: where will innovation come from? Um, can we continue to utilize what we have learned now and take it to the next level, or do we turn conservative and just want to? everything to be like it was in 2018, uh, including, for in- instance, use of cash in uh, German-speaking uh, euro, which really, really, really is weird to me. I mean, why do I need <laughs> coins? I never use coins, except, except when Bitcoin. I uh, uh, go to uh, yeah. Central Europe. I mean, but it, well, Finland is quite advanced, but Sweden is even more. So I, I don't think any Swede has coins. You know, everything is wireless. Uh, paid with uh, with credit card or like an Apple Watch, uh, and the uh, the um, central p- bank over there is uh, worried that when cash disappears and people have don't have it anymore, then the um, in crisis situation the the um, that would be a risk for society. Uh, that doesn't seem to be the case in uh, in Central Europe yet because everybody has cash. Um, yeah, Which it's just is something that should go away. This is this debate of, about personal freedom. So cash means personal freedom. It's connected to to a high ranked value in society. But yeah. um, but then you, are, you then you should actually use coal, gold because cash even that is issued by the government. You should really have small gold pieces and uh, and pay with that. I mean. This is a long debate. I think the problem, uh, one, in my opinion, one reason of poverty is difficulty of distributing uh, gold and cash uh, to a vast majority of people. So, uh, it, gold in the past it was very risky to 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 um, take gold with with you, uh, risk of robberies, uh, theft, stuff like that. Uh, it's the same with cash. So every every physical system is hard to distribute. What I really see uh, moving forward, and interestingly, uh, from from the Cardano space, uh, the the founder of Cardano thinks, I think, also in that direction, that with digital wallets and uh, cryptocurrencies, uh, if every person is connected to the system, the distribution of uh, of cash basically becomes a simple a simple a simple solvable problem. Um, but I agree. I mean, Austria sticks to to cash, and uh, politicians also claim that it's necessary to keep that alive. I don't see much reason why why we should have uh, physical money, anyways, mm. in the digital world. But, uh, so you think the main reason is uh, attitude and like um, the uh, it's a value. It's a, it's a, it's a social value. So social value. In- of- what social value? It's ingrained in the society, especially in the older population. Uh, that cash means freedom. Uh, that the ability of uh, withdrawing money from a bank means freedom. And, and then, uh, um, freedom how? The, 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 of state interference don't, or... Don't, 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 I, I, I just uh, uh, can reflect on what I read. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of physical money anyway, so um, I, I, I don't see a reason why it's necessary to keep that. You know, there is a very interesting startup uh, that I almost invested in, uh, based in um, in Germany. Um, they, their value proposition is that you can have all your net worth in physical gold in Swiss mountains mm. and still use that all the time. So when uh, and how? If you um, uh, if you Christian would have let's say a um, million euros worth of gold and that would be all your net worth, and then that would be. Uh, on their behind their service in Switzerland, in uh, inside the mountains, wherever you would have a credit card, you would still be have access to all that gold all the time. Because when you pay, they would uh, take a fraction of your gold stock 
and sell that on the spot market in return of uh, euros. Mm -hmm. And then uh, if you buy a cappuccino in Starbucks, uh, you would at the same time uh, make authorize them to make a transaction where you sell a portion of your gold. So you would own a little less gold and then instantly pay their fee and then at the same time pay the um, Starbucks for your cappuccino. Uh, and that is very interesting uh, concept. And uh, that, uh, do you think that would um, um, be acceptable to the elder Austrian population? I think it's uh, Michael Saylor from MicroStrategy uh, puts the same narrative or similar narrative that you explained right now on the market, uh, but it just uses Bitcoin uh, instead of gold. So it's also his claim that he say, look, I mean, if you put all your money into Bitcoin, uh, it's basically, in his opinion, digital gold. And uh, the similarity between your idea and uh, from, from the startup and Michael Saylor is that uh, I think we have uh, really the the first time in human history where a person can move around the world freely and take uh, the entire net worth with him or her. So it's basically dropping everything up in Europe and moving to the United States is just a click. It's just a mouse click and uh, you put all your wealth into Bitcoin or into this gold concept. And then you travel to the United States and start a new life there. When I think back 50 years, 50 years ago, um, it would have meant to withdraw all the money physically. I mean, in Europe, also credit cards were not really established uh, back then. Uh, then it depends on, on the net worth, I mean, selling all your real estate. And then you have uh, huge suitcases of physical money to carry to another bank or deposit it in a bank in Europe and ask them to transfer it uh, probably physically then to the United States. It was complicated. And now with the technology, I mean, this gold concept is one thing. And also the, uh, the Bitcoin concept is going in the direction that um, money is really easy transferable. Yeah, in a way. Uh, but then do you, uh, I think it's too early to tell whether people will retain trust in Bitcoin over the uh, cycles and um, and their political interference. And then of course the electricity use and all that, they they are issues. They may be solvable, but still uh, they are still issues. But for now, I think uh, Bitcoin is more a store storage of wealth mm -hmm. instead of uh, payment uh, system because not many places uh, accept it um, at the moment. And then the transaction costs still are quite uncomfortably high. Um, and then uh, also in case of, um, um, let's say, a very difficult war, including nukes and like uh, uh, electromagnetic pulses and so on, would Bitcoin wallets survive? Uh, I don't have an answer, but that's something that uh, will need to be solved. Uh, I, I, I still believe more, more people believe in uh, gold in Swiss mountains uh, physically than uh, Bitcoin in the cloud. Uh, that but may change. Is, but is it really safer? I mean, it's a matter I of... I don't know, <laughs> but, uh, but my claim is that still more people trust that instead of Bitcoin, but that may be changed. Uh, just imagine, I mean, it means putting all your money into one startup company uh, in the end of the day. So it's okay, it's gold in the Swiss mountains, but uh, on the forefront is just one company. Yeah, well, what, uh, what, the, what if this company is a second fire cut? <laughs> sure, sure, yeah. But I, I'm not, not now not talking about this particular company, but yeah. as, a, as a concept. Uh, yeah, no, no. I, I think that, that the learning here is from from Wirecard, uh, don't put uh, all eggs in one basket. Uh, it's a matter okay. of diversification. But I think, I mean, the the concepts that are coming now on the market are really great because uh, it really makes people independent from how they manage uh, their wealth in more non-traditional ways today than it was in the past. What, what was the past way? Real estate, you can buy houses mm. and if a war starts um, everything goes back to zero um, now there is there are other means bitcoin is one this gold idea is one uh, that you can also use gold for payment uh, then there are other cryptocurrencies also the stock market is much more flexible today than it was uh, 30 years ago i mean just imagine buying stock in the 90s um, 
it was a little bit more complicated than today. Today, it's a mouse click. So it's just uh, going online, buying shares and uh, selling them. Um, I think I don't think it was that easy in the 90s. But what mm -hmm. was your experience as an investment banker with, uh, with these technological advancements? Um, how was life for investment bankers in the 90s? Well, I was actually an investment banker from 2000 to 2011. Mm. I spent my late, 90, uh, late uh, 1990s in a pharmaceutical industry. Mm. But then um, I think there's not that much change uh, in investment banking because uh, already since mid-90s, capital of what it mattered in, in my world then uh, for institutional investors and big um, large cap uh, pharma companies, uh, it was available and flew across borders very freely already. Mm -hmm. So a hedge fund in New York could short a stock in Frankfurt or somebody in Spain could buy a stock in London. And that was very open already. So I think the bigger change is since, um, since 2000 and uh, well, noughties or two, early 2010s is in the retail side. Mm -hmm. Now, um, not only institutional investors can invest across borders. Now it is available for these reads, uh, these uh, Reddit guys and uh, men on the street. Uh, and also like cash transfers. We have the N22s and Revoluts and you can have multiple uh, currency accounts in your mobile phone, which was of course unthinkable in, um, uh, in, in the early, uh, in 1990s. So uh, I, I think um, the bigger changes have been on the retail side and the uh, democratization of capital, which is, I think, uh, very much a good thing, like we discussed uh, earlier already. But then, uh, of course, it, it will become uh, more and more difficult for professional money managers and capital managers to uh, really justify their existence because uh, retail investors can invest directly in stocks instead of uh, putting their money in, uh, in uh, mutual funds. I think it's a great it's it's a great advancement advancement for the the average people on the streets for retail investors. Um, 80s, 90s, it was basically savings accounts, and that was it with an interest rate. Um, people needed to create a certain amount of wealth to be uh, eligible for more sophisticated instruments, and now it's open to everybody. Also, when I look at, uh, at at multinational companies, I think, uh, as far as I remember from M&A, uh, transferring money, I mean, when you don't have to do it, it looks easy. But uh, looking into the 90s processes, it still was very complicated to transfer billions of dollars or euros around the world. For decision makers, it was just uh, um, telling somebody to do it, but behind there was a, a huge clearing process. Uh, when, yeah. yeah. And it was ex and it was expensive. When I look now on Bitcoin, and this is this is one part where I say uh, a system like Bitcoin makes sense. Uh, within an hour, you can transfer billions around the globe from from one party to the other party at a very reasonable price. I think the Bitcoin per transaction price is somewhere between three dollars and sixty dollars right now. It just uh, fluctuates over time, mm -hmm. depending on the. Uh, on the traffic on on the on the chain, I'm not an expert in that, but this is this is one use case where I think it makes sense. I mean, when companies start integrating Bitcoin into their balance sheets, and it looks like it's happening, M um, and A becomes pretty simple. Transferring money becomes pretty simple. So, well, I think uh, we will see. Uh, the jury is out um, on uh, what will happen, and also there may be new cryptos that. Uh, May be technology more technologically more advanced uh, than Bitcoin. Uh, don't have a um, answer to that. But uh, then again, it will be interesting to see when will the startup company start raising capital in Bitcoins instead of euros or dollars. That's a good question. <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, I mean, Tesla had. Uh, I think Elon Musk bought 1.5 billion. And then he sold it. He sold it already. Yeah, he, he said that he uh, he has changed his mind. Actually, it's not. A ah, okay, okay. So uh, yeah, we will we will see we will see where where the world is heading. I mean, it's getting more complex, but I think overall a good direction. A good direction. And this is coming back to the point: uh, who should have the power of trying out new things? Should it be politicians or entrepreneurs? I see a lot of dynamic on the corporate level to try out things, to try new things, to to develop. Uh, 
um, um, society in a good direction. I also see, see the same intent with politicians, but I think uh, the core focus of politics for me should be to set the regulations right. So like Europe, that we have an open market, open borders, uh, mm -hmm. that we have a transparent tax system uh, that is uncomplicated. I think this is enough work to solve. Uh, and let the entrepreneurs focus uh, on uh, solving other problems that are more suited to be put in that area. I agree. But then uh, it uh, looks like when, when whoever has power, uh, the politicians, they, they just cannot keep their hands off micromanagement. <laughs> and then uh, it's, uh, it is very difficult to leave solutions on crucial issues to, to market forces because then mm -hmm. you cannot take credit for it. Uh, it is kind of psychologically easier uh, for them to have a specific project and then uh, take credit for it, even if that does, does more harm elsewhere and is contradictory to another specific project elsewhere. So then um, we end up with uh, situations where a poor entrepreneur does not know what is legal and what is not because uh, there are two laws that are in conflict with each other, and um, that's not nice. <laughs> I'm sure I, I have lived in uh, three countries, well, actually five, but uh, for a longer time in three countries in Europe, uh, Finland, uh, United Kingdom, and Switzerland. And I am sure uh, it is not possible to move from one country to another uh, without breaking some laws. There are, there's always a law that uh, you don't know exists, and then you uh, break it and then no one cares. And there was the former Estonian president, um, Thomas Ilves, who once said that he had, um, as being an, uh, while being an advisor in a, uh, um, in a uh, company, he had learned that if you drive a modern car uh, like Tesla from Netherlands to Belgium, you break uh, 15 uh, privacy laws uh, and no one cares. I have not done my DD on that, but when it comes from an ex-president of a country, that's probably true. Um, yeah, I think uh, there is some truth in it, in it. But I think on the complexity of doing business in Europe, um, working together across borders, um, it's really still complicated. So I think there's an, a lot of room for improvement. Um, but it's going in the other direction. It's also what I saw in COVID. Uh, it's more micromanagement, more regulations, more laws. And this is also then going in a, in a, towards a situation where people don't know, uh, do they break laws? Does it matter? Doesn't it matter? And uh, I think this insecurity on the market is just not uh, good for uh, fostering uh, world-class companies. Mm. True. That is unfortunate true. Well, that's one of the common themes in the sectors I'm active in, life sciences and mm -hmm. uh, index. These are the most heavily regulated. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so somebody called me a, a regulation masochist uh, when I'm doing justice. Uh, and of course, the regulation has, serves a purpose. They have good intention. And uh, when executed well, they can actually facilitate business and not impede it. Uh, but uh, too often, unfortunately, the good intention turns into um, a hindrance uh, for new ideas and uh, scaling up. Yeah, this was uh, interesting in 2008 and uh, as, as Bitcoin emerged out of uh, the chaos of uh, a failing banking system. Um, how do you see this trend with cryptocurrencies? Well, what's, uh, what's, what's your view on that? I mean, you mentioned gold. Uh, uh, well, what what will crypto, the crypto world look like in 10 years, in your opinion, as a fintech expert? I think there will be more of them and uh, not necessarily Bitcoin being the dominant one. Uh, but I do think that in the end, the central banks will launch their own uh, e-currencies, mm -hmm. uh, which then uh, will compete with the cryptos. Um, but then the real question is um, money creation because the central bank does not create money, it is the banking system. Mm -hmm. uh, so how do you create a banking system for cryptos? You would need somebody who takes crypto deposits and then multiplies that and issues loans. So the, well, the classical banking uh, money multiplier stuff. I haven't seen that. I, I just saw actually today 
a um, a Finnish company had raised money from uh, Coinbase mm. and others who do a little bit uh, to that direction. They take they they issue loans in fiat currency, uh, and then um, then uh, the the customer can um, sorry how does it work sorry which way around yeah it was they. Uh, they give uh, hand out loans in uh, fiat currency so that the customer can invest in cryptos, um, which is the uh, first time I, I heard of that. Uh, I, a true crypto believer, probably would do it the other way around. Uh, but then at least that is uh, a uh, first mechanism where some kind of money creation start involving crypto starts to emerge. But then for the real thing to happen, you would need a crypto bank that takes deposits in uh, in uh, Bitcoin and hands out uh, Bitcoin uh, loans and uh, has all these well, services around that. Mm. And um, maybe there exists one, but I have not heard of one yet. I'm new to the field. For me, it's still complicated and difficult to understand. It's a, it's a completely new thing. Um, I'm trying to understand it for four years now, and I'm um, still still feels like I'm failing. <laughs> so I'm not an expert. I think the traditional banking system was set up to distribute money and gold around the world, basically. So it's uh, the last. Yeah. The question is: Do we really need this traditional banking system anymore? If wasn't that the the initial intent of uh, Satoshi Nakamoto to just prove that uh, all the functions of a banking system, which is Evolves around distributing cash and distributing money. This was the explanation I got in, I think, back in the 90s when um, the leader of a huge Austrian bank just said uh, um, uh, the focus of any bank should be distributing money, <laughs> bringing money to people, and that's it. So I think this was something that uh, resembled Bitcoin to just say you don't need a traditional system anymore. It's, uh, it's can be automated, but I'm not an expert in that. So just guessing. <laughs> I, ho I hope to get the the solution to everything from you. You're the expert in this field. <laughs> well, I uh, I'm possibly more expert than you, but I don't think anyone really is expert in, uh, in uh, this field. Um, cryptos they are complicated, but then on the other hand, the the basic uh, economic laws do not change. They mm -hmm. are technology yep. independent, technology agnostic. So what was true with uh, gold in ancient Egypt, what is the tr what was true in uh, fiat currencies or gold standard will also be true with cryptos in the end. Yep. Uh, and then it is about trust of people. Who, who do you trust to, have, to uh, re retain wealth and uh, what kind of stuff you expect in, uh, in payments. There have been parts in history when the states had that trust, a uh, gold-backed gold standard or otherwise, it may be something else going forward. I personally would rather lend uh, money by buying bonds of McDonald's than bonds of Greece uh, at the moment. But uh, I'm a minority of them here. I'm probably wrong because the market tells me that Greece is more uh, trustworthy than McDonald's uh, corporation. Uh, so you see, I mean, the, it's not a simple uh, question to answer. I'm I'm a member of the tech sect, so I'm a true believer in uh, in, in growth stocks and uh, in the success of technology and uh, teams that move uh, technology forward. Also in the coming ten years, mm -hmm. uh, I'm highly impressed by people like uh, Jeff Bezos, for example. Uh, who proved that uh, with a sound idea and a profound execution, it's really possible to create significant wealth and uh, improve society tremendously. I'm uh, not a critic of Emerson in, in any way. Um, when I just look at uh, what he did for the people during the lockdowns. So just imagine uh, a lockdown without Amazon, a lockdown without uh, internet companies, a lockdown without Facebook. Uh, a lockdown in the 90s would have meant isolation. Mm -hmm. uh, today, everything got delivered and we live in the best times ever. So when I want to buy something, I go online, I get it delivered for free as a Prime member uh, to my doorstep. Mm -hmm. And this is pretty amazing. I was not aware of that before the pandemic. And so I agree to that, what you said earlier, that uh, there are good sides to the lockdowns and the pandemic to discover technology from a new way. 
I'm also impressed by Mark Zuckerberg or what Steve Jobs did with the smartphones. Uh, all these things really helped to move society forward. And this is the reason why I say, I mean, we should help uh, when such personalities emerge. Uh, it's rare, uh, but then uh, we should really uh, look to support them and to move their ideas forward uh, to change the world to the better. And I think there are enough entrepreneurs on the market. Um, so let's just see that uh, Europe uh, becomes a united market and uh, less regulated and more access to capital, especially in the early stages. Mm. Um, then I'm pretty sure that uh, also European tech can uh, go back uh, um, to become again, like it was in the 90s, uh, players in the major league uh, of tech, and uh, which I don't see currently. Agreed. Are there any issues we uh, we agreed we would cover? Uh, I, think, I think we had a very nice uh, conversation. Let me ask you one final question. question. Yeah. Uh, in this world of complexity, when someone wants to start a company in Europe, uh, what's your most important advice to young entrepreneurs these days? Um, I would, uh, I have very conservative advice. Uh, I would advise to first work for a few years in a company. Mm -hmm. um, because uh, obviously, if you graduate and start a company immediately, then uh, yeah, financing is one issue. But then um, you also learn a lot of uh, basic things that you don't then need to learn again on your own expense, basically. So generally, that is good advice. Uh, of course, there are exceptions. Uh, there are companies that I have seen where people have started while still in university and, uh, and never graduate. Um, so there are exceptions to every rule. But in general terms, I think the uh, advice would be to work first for a few years for somebody else. Um, and then also, after that, obviously, it becomes more difficult to quit your day job when you get used to the paycheck and, and all that. But then that just tests you how committed you are, how much you believe in your own ideas, how that you, uh, you want to do it. And then also, if you don't like working for somebody else, then that experience will give you strength later as a uh, entrepreneur because you remember that. Yeah, I tried that and I left it. I, I don't want, want to go back there. I think also for entrepreneurs, there will always be someone we need to work for. I think entrepreneurship is uh, is service, is service to other people. It doesn't matter if it's a boss or if it's a customer. Mm -hmm. uh, Tero, thank you very much for this nice conversation. I always enjoy speaking with you and hearing your insights into the industry. If you don't mind, I put your uh, LinkedIn content uh, contact data into the description of the podcast and invite people to reach out to you if they have further questions. Definitely, yes. One thing we didn't touch was uh, chess boxing, which I also advise everybody who's um, listening to this to check uh, uh, www.nordicchessboxing.com. I'm organizing the, uh, as a, aside from the uh, stuff we discussed here, I'm also organizing a chess boxing event in Helsinki on 2nd of October. So I think that's a great support for anyone who is uh, investing and uh, being active in life sciences field to really uh, take your mind out of the ordinary business and to focus on the two very demanding disciplines. Yeah, we'll add it to the description as well. I think it's an interesting concept to combine uh, chess competitions with boxing competitions in, in one single event. How, how much time... Uh, does it take? Is it uh, an, a whole day event or is it? Uh, That's one evening. There will be four fights evening. and uh, mm -hmm. fight night from uh, 7 to, to 11. And uh, so chess and boxing are in the same event. So you can win by either knockout or by uh, checkmate. So that uh, that tests you both physically and um, mentally. Like they say in Latin, men sana in corpore sana. Mm -hmm. Um, and there will also be, is this the dinner food uh, at the location? Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you're going to watch it by, uh, you're going to buy the stream ticket and watch it. So. Oh, it's a streaming. Yeah, but there will be right. stream. I can uh, send you a link. So. Yeah, send me the link in the bulletin description. When is it exactly? Uh, 2nd of October. So, 2nd uh, of October. 
That's, yeah. uh, but all, uh, if you ever have needed an excuse to visit Helsinki, that would be, could be. Would be a great thing. I hope we can travel in October and we don't get another lockdown. It would be great to attend physically uh, at the event. Tiaro, thank you very much for the nice conversation. Um, let's stay in touch and uh, revisit the content in a year from now and chat again. <laughs> good. Thank you, Christian. Have a good day and a great summer. Have a great day. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Please, please share the podcast and make sure you've subscribed. Have a great day. Mm -hmm.